Okay, on behalf of the Education Committee, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Lynch. The Education Committee asked Bob early in the year what Sunday or two he might help us by giving a lesson, and today and next Sunday are our lucky Sundays. Now, I think almost all of you know Dr. Lynch, but maybe Cheryl and Marvin and some other the new people don't know his background, so I'm going to give it to you because it's pretty impressive. He is a has a four, he had a 45-year career as an interventional cardiologist, and he had a special interest in prevention of cardiovascular disease. He was the chief of medicine and cardiology at the U.S. Army Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand, which means he loves Asian food. He is co-founder of the American Heart Institute, a nationally recognized provider of comprehensive cardiovascular services. He served in many leadership positions throughout his career. He was president of the medical staff at Hillcrest, chief of cardiology at Hillcrest, and he's director of quality oversight programs. So anybody who does anything about healthcare knows quality is really the main thing, and QC and all of that is, is it's in Bob's heart. He's a two-time recipient of the Jerry Pulls MD Award for Achievement in Quality Care, and Dr. Pulls was my mom and dad's cardiologist, and when I saw that, I get Bob now, I mean, he's, uh, it's really, it's in their heart to, to be service to us. He's, he has been president of the Tulsa American Heart Association, clinical assistant professor, University of Oklahoma College of um, uh, Medicine here at Tulsa, and he's director of Lipid and Wellness Clinic at the Oklahoma Heart Institute. He's presented lots of seminars. We're going to learn a lot today and a lot more next week, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Lynch. Wow, thank you, Connie. Um, the check will be in the mail, uh, by the way. <laughs> well, so uh, I debated long and hard about this topic. Uh, it's, uh, I normally like to give topics that have uh, positivity to them, uh, uplifting, positive, and so on. Unfortunately, this topic does not. It lends itself more toward some negative aspects of medicine. But honestly, I was hoping the title would deter people from coming, but obviously <laughs> uh, that didn't seem to happen, so here we are. The corporatization of healthcare is something that has been occurring over the last few decades. Uh, it is becoming progressively more common, more extensive. Uh, what this means is corp corporations, they may be hospitals, they are pharmacies, they are health, care or health insurance providers, and more and more, they are private equity that are invested in all aspects of health care, whether it's ownership of hospitals, uh, ownership of single or multi-specialty physician groups, uh, nursing homes, uh, dialysis centers, surgical centers, particularly private equity is playing a role in these. And so there's a lot of implications for the healthcare system in general, a lot of implications for physicians, and particularly, and the real reason for this talk today is, there are a lot of implications for patients, consumers of healthcare, of which everyone in the room is or has been or will be. It's important because most people aren't aware of this are not aware of the implications, are not aware of what happens when corporations become involved in healthcare and make decisions and influence physicians' behavior and influence access to healthcare. Dr. William Osler is considered the father of medicine, basically. He developed uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital healthcare system. He developed uh, residency programs and um, was very, very influential in a lot of physicians, and no fine for coming in late, Becky, it's okay, don't worry. So, <laughs> uh, so he had a statement that said, the practice of medicine is, is an art, not a trade. The practice of medicine is a calling, not a business. The practice of the calling and practice of medicine depends on utilizing the heart as well as utilizing the head. Unfortunately, that concept, that saying, is becoming less and less evident, prevalent 
uh, thought about in today's modern healthcare, which is being taken over essentially by corporations in general. So that, that, that concept has been lost, is being lost. Corporization is well entrenched in the healthcare system. Uh, there are large regional and national hospital sy systems and insurers which are playing a role in healthcare that's increasing, becoming progressive. A number, uh, a growing number of health care providers are becoming for-profit as opposed uh, for non-profit. So medicine today, the outcome of this is medicine today is not the medicine that I have known uh, for 45 years and it's not the medicine that you all have known for the last few decades. A little uh, example as to the magnitude of some of this, private equity firms uh, basically acquired about uh, 355 physician, uh, physician practices uh, with many hundreds of doctors uh, from the time frame of about 2013 to 2016. In the four years after that, 2016 to 2020, uh, another 578 physician practices were uh, taken over by corp corporate entities, by private equity firms. And these numbers continue to grow. Uh, there is the expectation that these private equity firms have of achieving profits of 20 to 30 percent. And so we'll talk about, well, how do they achieve those profits? That's important to know. Do they cut costs? The answer is yes. Uh, do they try to increase services? Because in the American healthcare system, the, the more you do, the more that you're paid. And so the answer to that is yes. And so we'll discuss that a little bit further as we go along. So I want to show you uh, one slide here. I will show you no slides here. Uh, what did I do? Oh, I undid it. Back, uh, Hank. <laughs> okay, it's got the password. I hit the wrong button, so uh, thank you. I know. It's always good to have somebody there. Yeah, they, they are basically institutional investors that contribute equity, contribute money in, into this entity that's called a private equity firm. Right. Yeah, I know, so that was pretty cool. So you wonder, how, well, how did he ever do a heart cast for heaven's sakes again? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so here, here's a, a slide that, that shows healthcare expenditures. Uh, you can see this is from 1960 to present time. Uh, shows the increase in the U.S. population, and so they've, it's increased dramatically. But here's something that uh, is very interesting. Look at the growth. Uh, the yellow shows the growth of administrators in the healthcare system. The brown line shows a percent growth in U.S. healthcare spending per capita, but the bottom line shows physicians. And this is going to be one of the reasons why healthcare costs uh, and are, are, have increased and are increasing. And so we will now turn that off. Let me go back to that. So, uh, some other, other um, entities, Amazon is getting into the healthcare system. Uh, they announced last year, in July of last year, announced plans to uh, acquire a corporation called One Medical, which is a primary care practice that has over 200 locations uh, throughout the United States, which serves more than 700,000 patients. This deal was for $3.9 billion. Not to be deterred, CBS has plans and is becoming a major player in the healthcare system. They uh, acquired Signify Health, which is a uh, home, uh, in-home and traditional primary care for about $8 billion. Uh, last year, uh, the CEO of CBS announced uh, that it would begin providing physician services by the end of 2022. So far, that has actually not happened, but CVS has been 
toward uh, becoming a health care provider for decades. Uh, you can already, as you know, get vaccines, you can get diabetes testing, uh, you can even get um, care for some illnesses at some CVS stores. Uh, they have these uh, entities that are called Minute Clinics, usually staffed by what are called mid-level providers. And uh, they have a full-service health hub, which does have uh, ability to deliver pretty much comprehensive medical care. The CEO of CVS, her name is Karen Lynch, no relationship, by the way, she says, quotes, with the collection of assets that we have comes the ability to dramatically reshape how consumers experience health care. Now, that could be in a good way, in a positive way, or it could be not. Cigna is in the game. They joined forces with a Walgreens holding company uh, in, a, again, an $8.9 billion deal to create a massive doctor's group. And United Health has been buying up physician practices for several years. Walmart's in the game. Walmart has established uh, about uh, two dozen health clinics in the state of Florida, which is just the beginning. So you can see the magnitude of this, the magnitude of the dollars, the extent to which these corporations are becoming involved in health care. It's interesting that in 1988, only about 28% of physicians uh, were employed by a corporation. That has now changed to where over 70% of physicians are employed by a corporation, not in solo practice or group practice that's, that's self-owned. So why has all this occurred? Why has corporization in the healthcare system occurred? Because of the finance, the financial situation. Our health system has always been based on the fact that illness equals profit. Uh, the financial incentives have been toward more testing, more procedures, not fewer, more medicines, not less, treating illness after the fact as opposed to trying to prevent illness. Next week I'm going to talk to you about a um, new concept of healthcare that is di distinctly different, but to focus more on early detection, uh, prevention, and to try to get progressively away from waiting until an acute problem happens until the, the tumor appears in your abdomen or the heart attack occurs. Well, it's also interesting to know that while the United States healthcare system has been uh, among the most technologically uh, advanced healthcare systems, it also has the highest cost of any comparable countries, and in fact, poor outcomes, poor outcomes. U.S. spending on health care has increased from about 8% of gross domestic product to about uh, 17, 18% as of four or five years ago, far, far ahead in health care spending compared to the next closest country, which is Switzerland, which spends about 12.2% of gross domestic product. The United States healthcare system can be contrasted to that of Western Europe. Europe spends about $6,000 per individual per year for healthcare compared to $12,000 per person per year in the United States. We spend way, way too much of our healthcare dollar on profit and on inefficiency. The corporatization of healthcare is distinctly playing a role in this. So what is the impact? This corporate drive for ever increasing earnings and executive pay, which executives in healthcare organizations uh, make uh, tens of millions of dollars. For instance, um, Hilka's healthcare system was originally bought, was called Ardent Healthcare System, which was then bought out by Ventus, E-N-T-A-S. Ventus is, of course, a real estate investment trust. Ventus has 14 Executive, executive vice president positions. And guess what? None of those are a physician, none. They are MBAs, bean counters, and so on. The salary for the CEO of Ventus is about $14 million a year. And there are bonus incentives for bonuses. Uh, for Ascension, same story. They do have one physician on, on their uh, governing board. 
the salary of that CEO, again, the same, about $14 million, all occurring while the people on the front line, the nurses particularly, their salaries are not increasing at all. The salaries of the executives are increasing about 6.8% per year, way above the salaries of the people on the front lines. In 2010, there was an Institute of Medicine uh, published report that declared that 30% of healthcare spending in the United States, about $750 billion, is totally wasteful. More than half of that weight, waste was due to unnecessary health services, and I'll explain how that happens in a little bit, and also excess administrative cost, i.e. that slide that I just showed you about the es escalating numbers of administrators. Uh, that from 1975 to 1990, uh, administrators present in hospitals increased by about 2,000%, and it's shown no sign of, of decreasing. And I forgot to mention, by the way, if anybody has any questions, other than Mike Bartlett, but if anybody has questions, uh, interrupt, ask questions a long way. So how do corporate investors generate profit uh, from healthcare facilities and physician practices? Well, when private equity firms invest in any company, uh, they typically install their hand-packed, hand-picked, <laughs> pick, pack, you know, poke, <laughs> whatever, okay. Well, they bring in their team, their MBAs that have a focus on one, reducing costs, and on two, increasing revenue. And they analyze the balance sheet and they start reducing costs. And in hospitals and healthcare systems, they start with the most expensive item, and that is personnel. Uh, they reduce the number of physicians. They're replaced by lower level, mid levels. And I'll talk about those in some, some negative, some positive. Uh, our corporation uses a lot of mid level providers. You have to in these days because the, the volume of, of um, patients is overwhelming and physicians, there are not enough physicians to keep up with it. Nonetheless, one of the ways they do is uh, the, the corporate entity reduces cost is by changing the, the mix of the uh, healthcare personnel that they employ. In other words, they replace expensive staff, i.e. doctors, uh, with uh, nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. They have less equivalent training uh, the other way that uh, corporations uh, make a profit, other than reducing costs, is they promote hospitalizations, they encourage the ordering of more tests. Every test generates revenue, so there is no incentive to reduce testing. A Dartmouth study was done and found that for most patients, simply getting more services did not did not result in better outcomes because there, is, there are complications that can occur with over-testing. You get false positives and then you go down a road of getting multiple other tests to confirm or disprove that. Another way that the corporate entities uh, increase their revenue is by what's called up-coding. In other words, they elevate the level of intensity of illness and services above and beyond what reality is, and so that way they can generate more income. Corporate investment uh, in emergency rooms is particularly prevalent. Uh, about 25 to 40 percent of all emergency rooms in the United States are now staffed by private equity companies. Uh, there is one group called Envision Healthcare, uh, which is a nationwide hospital-based uh, physician group, has about 25,000 physicians. It staffs about one in 10 or 12 emergency rooms throughout the United States. Well, why do the corporations love emergency rooms? Well, it's not ongoing care. It's acute care, and so they're not involved with the cost that it goes into ongoing care. Uh, there's no need for pre-authorization for anything. Uh, they come in, you're ill, you can do whatever you want as far as testing and so on. Um, and, and so uh, private equity firms 
urge physicians in emergency rooms to overtest and overtreat. There was a recent study concluded that high intensity billing, meaning the upcoding, for expensive emergency service has gone up 400% in the last several years. Doctors are disappearing from emergency rooms. Their emergency rooms employ fewer doctors. Uh, they replace them again with nurse practitioners and physician's assistants as a way uh, to reduce the top expense, which is physician labor. And so the quest to save money results in treatment being meted out, perhaps by someone with less training than a physician, uh, which can and has the potential to leave patients uh, vulnerable to misdiagnosis, to inadequate care, and higher medical bills. There was a working paper by what's called the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, which analyzed 1.1 million visits to about 44 different emergency rooms throughout the United States. These were emergency rooms where nurse practitioners could manage, treat and manage, diagnose patients without physician supervision and determine that there was a 7% increase in cost associated with that uh, when there was no physician oversight. Uh, there was an 11% increase in the length of stay in the emergency room. Uh, and uh, emergency room patients that were treated by uh, nurse practitioners had about a 20% increase incidence of being readmitted to the hospital for preventable reasons that could have been, been prevented. Also about a 5% increase in what are called imaging tests. These are x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, and so on. Uh, the share of, um, well, the concern is that the pressure to turn big profits will influence life or death decisions uh, that were once left solely to physicians. Now, I'm not saying that all nurse practitioners are not good. We have several in our group that are very, very good. In my, my opinion, some of them are equal to physicians and better than some physicians, but that's not true throughout the United States. I think there's evidence to say that this type of practice is just simply not good for patients. There's more, more data is needed along those lines as far as whether quality of care is, is negatively or positively impacted, but so far uh, the brunt of the evidence seems to be that, that it raises concern, that it may negatively impact care. So, corporization has made the American healthcare system seem more businesslike uh, in, by encouraging what I said, by encouraging uh, for profit and private equity investment and putting more emphasis on making money than in treating patients, profit versus patients. The increased corporization of healthcare in the United States has led to, to less personal medical care for the most part less attentive doctors in some situations. Physicians serve multiple masters, serve patients, but they also serve the employers, and the employers serve the shareholders. And so uh, it gets into a difficult situation in which physicians have to answer both to patients and to the, their corporate or hospital employers. And those, as I mentioned, those hospital uh, corporate em employers or not physicians. They, they just don't simply understand the nuances of medical care. So medical decision making, uh, well, I want to mention one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Everybody hear the question about urgent care? Urgent care is in, in this mix as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, one of our, I don't think today, I don't, don't see them, but uh, two members of our class, she became ill with acute abdominal pain, went to that new urgent care facility on 71st across from Tulsa Hills, was told that it was a cash only, <laughs> no insurance, cash only, and it was going to cost some outrageous sum, $1,000 for a blood test, and, and so that, of that. My point 
Now, I had a uh, discussion recently, and I was uh, talking to him to say, well, what, what in your opinion and your experience has corporatization in the healthcare system led to? Two words, poor care. And I'll explain why that happens. That doesn't mean everybody gets poor care. I'm sure a lot of you are getting excellent care. I'm just saying as a general, these are things you need to be aware of and, and pay attention to. And why is that poor? A lot of the corporate investors don't reinvest in equipment. They have outdated x-ray equipment or x-ray equipment that emits more radiation than is currently uh, emitted by up-to-date uh, x-ray equipment, uh, laboratory services, and of course the personnel. So they tend, since they have a time frame of three, four, five years, then they tend not to spend their money reinvesting in the institution that they manage. So that, that's a concern as well. Um, so this, this move toward uh, uh, the uh, corporatization of healthcare has sort of been going on for several decades, and it's almost led to a situation where uh, its healthcare has become more of a consumer service. And I'm sure you all have experienced this, delays in scheduling visits, delays in scheduling tests, uh, which is fairly commonplace. Uh, we know about the utilization of mid-level providers, uh, experiences with physicians interacting more with their computers in the exam room than they are with the patient. And I've experienced this personally. I had taken my son uh, uh, to um, Southwestern in Texas uh, to see a neurologist there, a specialist, a great reputation, Ex experienced that. He spent 90% of his time interacting with the computer about 10% interacting with, with me and, and with my son. So I know this is a real event. I don't know if some of you experienced that, but uh, it's prevalent. Uh, our question is actually, I've um, seen registers to always be in the room and in essence be the scribe, be the note taker while the physician interacts with the patient. You know, I keep waiting for uh, the uh, administrators to want to start reducing the of registered nurses. And, uh, doctors ought to work directly for patients. Uh, is this going on all the time? It's going on and off. I don't know. Uh, I'd prefer it just be off and then I could go in. <laughs> anyway, uh, th there is the concept that, that physicians ought to work directly for patients, uh, free from it, the corporate shareholders, and uh, any other external influences. Um, there became a doctrine, a uh, medicine doctrine, that stated that number one, it's uh, understanding that allowing corporations to practice medicine or employ physicians will result in the commercialization in the practice of medicine. Number two, a corporation's obligation is to its shareholders, which may not align with the physician's obligation to his patients. Number three, employment of a physician by a corporation may interfere with the physician's independent judgment. Patient welfare must be, should be, uh, the only driving goal for physicians for medicine. An increase in number of patients over recent years have noted that appointments in doctor's offices often feel rushed, or they've been in an emergency department or clinic, uh, feeling as though they were just another number on the list to be crossed off. Many patients noted that they felt that they had to reintroduce themselves to their physicians. Uh, there's been a transfer of these principles uh, uh, business models into medicine. The problem is, the problem is that, that applying these principles to healthcare systems is, is a mass effect of depersonalizing medicine as a whole and affecting the sanctity of the patient-physician relationship. What is happening is the implementation of these systems is a transformation of this relationship, this doctor-patient relationship, into one of producer and consumer, 
with the commodity of trade being the health of the consumer. As a result of cost cutting and need to generate more revenue, providers are forced to see more in a smaller window of time, uh, while assisting staff uh, have been reduced in terms of numbers and asked to do more tasks in shorter periods of time. This may lead and does lead to mediocre patient care. And many of these company, companies uh, influence or establish performance metrics for physicians. And these performance metrics, of course, are not about the quality of the care. They're about the financial aspect of it. Uh, so that the um, attention of the provider, it seems, to, can be uh, shifted away from the pa patient into these um, metrics that are, are, have been determined. Well, <laughs> on a less positive note, <laughs> there are, <clears throat> excuse me, that have been identified in the system. Polls have been taken, and it seems that only about 7% in these polls, only about 7% are completely satisfied with their current healthcare system. This is desire change, amazing, is even across political lines. Uh, so there is rather uniform agreement, at least 60 or 70% from multiple political affil affiliations agree. The healthcare system needs changes or needs a complete overhaul. And according to a Gallup poll, seven in 10, 70% of people in the, think the current health care system is, quotes, in a state of crisis, unquotes, or, quotes, having major problems, unquotes. So what are the eight major problems? Number one is preventable medical errors. 250,000 people die every year because of preventable medical errors, which accounts for 10% of all deaths in the United States, which makes it the third leading cause of death behind heart disease and cancer. Number two is what's called poor amenable mortality rates. In other words, mortality that could have been prevented and treated by effective and timely care. The United States ranked last of eight countries, of eight comparable countries in this measurement. Number three is the lack of transparency, and I think you all are aware of that. Um, there certainly is presence of fraud. There is the issue of the upcoding that I alluded to. Finding a good doctor, how do you do that? I mean, there's no report cards. There's, there's no, uh, you can't go to uh, health grades. I mean, that's ridiculous. It gives no relevant information. Uh, you need to know consumers rely on uninformed online reviews. Uh, they don't offer critical information about the health care that the patient has. Well, what is this physician's expertise in taking care of that particular problem? Wouldn't that be good to know, it would seem like to me. And so how you assess a physician's skill level? You don't. I bet, do any of you think that you have a, a good way to assess who a good doctor is? Because I don't think there's enough data to say. We don't publish the, the data. The fifth problem with health care is, of course, the high cost. It's just amazing. It's spending in health care reached uh, about $3.8 or $9 trillion uh, in 2019. It's projected to reach $6.19 trillion. Uh, in 2028, just five years from now, and at that time account for 19.7% of gross domestic product. For one example, a cesarean sex in the United States may cost $15,000 or more, whereas in the next highest cost country, it's 8,400, which is Australia. Procedures in the United States cost 50% more than they do in other comparable countries. A lot of reasons for that, but um, the trajectory of that is, is not very healthy. Lack of insurance coverage, still a problem. Nursing and physician shortage is a problem and is going to become more of a problem. There's predicted to be a shortage of anywhere from 54,000 to over 120,000, 39,000 primary and specialty care physicians by the year 2033 occurring at a time uh, that uh, demand is increasing. Yes?
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's the latter. It's, it's the, not the real cost, but it's the cost that's billed. I mean, basically, you know, all providers, hospitals and so on, they try to test it. They raise prices as high as they possibly can go and test the system, test Medicare, test Medicaid, test insurers to see what they will pay for that. And so the numbers I'm referring to, I think, are, are not the real cost. Having fun? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Keenan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Forward to uh, as well. Uh, as I said, I don't like to give negative talks, but I think this one became essential. Uh, to make you aware. It's a downer, I get it. But next week it'll be more uplifting. <laughs> I won't be here, but uh, there will be. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, good. Uh, yes, sir. What do you think to malpractice insurance premiums drive doctors to join these corporations? Yeah, that, that's, a good, that, that's a good question. Um, there are multiple reasons for uh, physicians joining the corporations, large corporations. That's among the reasons uh, that is true. I mean, as you know, some specialties have outrageous medical care, uh, medical malpractice insurance rates, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of issues about medical malpractice. I'm not going to get into that right now. That's why malpractice occurs. Does that answer your question? Um, and we had one other. Oh, no, there was one other question. Yes. Absolutely. Fear of medical practice leads to unnecessary testing. And that happens a lot in emergency rooms. Uh, and, you know, they, for fear of missing a diagnosis, then, then they'll uh, clearly um, do a lot of testing out of fear from missing a diagnosis, both for patient care concerns and, and medical legal concerns. I want to point out that there are conflicting views about the uh, presence of corporations in healthcare. The proponents of it cite benefits. They say it provides a new impetus for innovation. I'm not sure, it may. Uh, more responsiveness to the needs and desires of patients and physicians. I don't think there's evidence for that, but that's what proponents have said. They say there's sounder approaches to management. And I think probably importantly is it's an important source of capital for health services. For physicians, the access to capital uh, is important, particularly with the need for information technology. Uh, being relieved of the administrative burden of managing a practice is a reason for joining a corporation. A stable compensation, perhaps flexible working hours, uh, these are all reasons why physicians leave solo practices and practices. On the other hand, there's always an on, an on the other hand. Some observers see for-profit healthcare organization as being antithetical to the traditional mission and values of the healthcare institutions. They view it as a threat to the autonomy and ideals of the medical profession. They view it as destructive of the implicit social arrangements between physicians and patients. One author described what called a medical industrial complex, comprising investor-owned hospitals, uh, nursing homes, and diagnostic laboratory services that would put the interest of shareholders above that of the, of the patient. So you can see there's sort of a common theme here that I'm repeating, and that has to do with revenue profits versus patient care. So 
With that in mind, I think uh, a few comments about the cost of, of healthcare uh, and comparisons between for-profit institutions and non-profit. For-profit hospitals do tend to charge higher prices, and research has shown that hospitals often set prices well above the cost allowed by Medicare, and charges uh, by for-profit uh, are especially high. CT scans, MRIs, anesthesiology services are all high cost uh, and have high cost to charge ratios. Some evidence shows that uh, the for-profits make money by focusing on more profitable services like heart surgery and spend less on low profit services like emergency psychiatric care. So finances is playing a role in who, who gets optimal medical care and who does not. It's interesting to note that some for-profit hospitals tend to do cesarean sections more frequently than non-profit hospitals doing vaginal deliveries. So why, why is that? Why does it vary from state to state? Again, the profit motive, I think, plays a role. However, and I said this before, higher costs do not equate to higher quality. For-profit hospitals have higher readmission rates. These are rates that are monitored very closely as, as a, um, a, a signal of, of the quality of the health care. If a patient has been treated in a hospital but gets readmitted within a few weeks, that's kind of a, a negative. It means that the care probably wasn't adequate in the first place. So for-profit hospitals do have higher readmission rates. For-profit hospitals have also been associated with increased age adjusted with increased adjusted mortality. Now that's important compared to those uh, versus nonprofit. Another review found that mortality rates tend to increase in a previously nonprofit hospital that became for profit. However, there's mixed evidence about this and I think further research is going to need to be done. Talk a minute about private equity. I've alluded to that uh, along the way here, uh, uh, define what private equity is. So they, they tend to invest in corporations that they see as having a potential to return a profit. That potential is realized if the private equity company can increase value, uh, but typically they look at returns of 20 to 30 percent, as they mentioned, and they then resell it in three to seven years. That's what happens. Private equity firms are now involved in most facets of the healthcare system. Acute care hospitals, dialysis centers, surgical centers, home health services, physician practice management. Anesthesiology. I've been accused of being an anesthesiologist because I put people to sleep when I'm talking a lot. I don't know. <laughs> anesthesiology, multi-specialty groups. Emergency medicine, family practice, and dermatology are subspecialties that have the highest representation in uh, private equity-owned specialty practices and clinics. So uh, private equity firms uh, attempt to monopolize the healthcare market. Well, one way is the staffing emergency rooms that I've talked about. Uh, another way is uh, the ownership of hospital-based departments, anesthesiology, radiology, pathology, can contract independently with private equity firms. They boost prices after that, but they boost the incomes of the physicians. Uh, once they obtain exclusivity, then, then they demand higher rates from the payers, from the insurance companies, and so on. Um, so, uh, and they're also involved in surgical centers. Proponents, again, looking at that side, says that uh, private equity firms can help curb inefficiencies in the system and reduce costs without diminishing quality. No evidence for that, but that's what their proponents say. Private equity forces healthcare entities to shift focus, as I said, from the investor uh, to the investor from the, the patient. And so another way that private equity firms generate a profit and cut costs is by uh, investing, purchasing lower quality uh, medical equipment and using uh, less expensive medical providers, i.e. the mid-level providers versus physicians. Private equity firms may pressure, they do pressure physicians to provide more and often unnecessary medical care. 
and they gamed the insurance system. New research reveals that private equity firms that acquire physician-owned practices do appear to be uh, instituting measures to squeeze out more profits. So it's just, just uh, ongoing concern, it's a reality. Um, I think the, uh, it's not clear whether a lot of these practices hurt patients or not, but there's some concern that it has the potential uh, to do that. Uh, the quality effects of corporate investment in healthcare merit further study, but there are concerns, as I mentioned. One study found that admission to a private equity owned nursing home was associated with a 10% increase in the risk of death. Uh, the expectation of greater than 20% in returns may conflict with the need for longer term investment, as I've mentioned, uh, practice stability, physician recruitment, quality, and safety. So the bottom line is the need to maximize profits for shareholders and investors may conflict with what's best. And I have a real easy question coming here. I know. Dr. Lynch, uh, what about VIP doctors? I assume that's corporate-driven in some sense. And it takes uh, primary care is off, off the market for a normal patient. Yeah. Um, let's see. How many hours do we have? Uh, we've got. Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, I don't have much else to say. Well, I do have some things to say, but, but I'm probably not going to about that, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, I don't know the answer to that for sure, but that won't stop me from answering it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I think it was probably was combined. I think that it was, uh, became progressively difficult for your internist to do both, to see patients in the clinic and then to see them in the hospital. Uh, so I think that played a role. And, and secondly, I think that has to do has to do with the economics uh, as well. I mean, hospitalists employed by the hospital can be influenced by the hospital, can be influenced by the corporation that owns the hospital. So there, there is some role there. I think the biggest concern, uh, hospitalists can be great uh, in, in terms of day-to-day -day management. The concern I have is the gap of information. You know, you see an internist for 20 years that has more than what's on the medical records. He has in his head what's been going on with you. Uh, that gap, that information gap gets lost when a hospitalist comes in. He doesn't know that. And I think to me that's, that's the, the greatest concern there. Uh, uh, the impact of corporate involvement in healthcare on physicians. Uh, it's changed the practice of medicine, no doubt about it. It's caused in the reports of this, uh, physicians to feel alienated from their work. An increasing number of physicians are retiring early. Uh, the suicide rate is the highest of all professions, three to 4,000 suicides per year uh, for physicians. Physicians have become frustrated, they've become unhappy uh, because they're burned out, not from working too hard, interestingly, but because they cannot practice medicine the way they think medicine should be practiced. One survey found that uh, one in five uh, healthcare workers had quit their job since the beginning of the pandemic, an additional 31% plan to retire, uh, leave their jobs within the next few years. There's been a sharp decline in applicants to medical schools. All of this is concerning because all this is occurring at a time that demand is increasing. Well, here's something that's really interesting, uh, and I'm going to read um, a summation of this. Uh, it's a concept of what's called moral injury. Physicians are experiencing that moral injury was initially used to describe uh, military uh, combatants in military zones that had to do something against their, their uh, upbringing and, and uh, so on in terms of innocent killing innocent people and so on and so on. So it's called moral injury. 
So there was a book written by this, uh, um, a very, very um, uh, important book. It's called If I Betray These Words, Moral Injury and Medicine, and Why It's So Hard for Clinicians uh, to Put Patients First. And so what I'm going to do is read the summation. Uh, throughout this book, there's a lot of examples of physicians. So, um, uh, play. Have to do. This is still going on. Can you hear me now? This was of Jay Newfield. He was a pediatric rehabilitation specialist uh, taking care of disabled children. He worked for a for profit hospital, St. Luke's Hospital and Children's Specialty Center in Boise, Idaho, to help keep the institution solvent, hospital administrators shorten his appointments, and increase patient volume. When he overstayed his scheduled time with a patient, an assistant would come in and say, Doctor, your time is up. It's time to go on and see the next patient. Then one of his colleagues quit. And so Dr. Newfield was the only physician left in his group. His request for more support went unanswered. When his contract came up for renewal, he faced a 30% salary cut. Subsequently, when the hospital's lack of physician coverage nearly led to the death of a patient, he further pressed his supervisors for help with this situation. But it was all in vain. Trapped, he eventually took his own life. Well, there are other examples. Of that. There's an example in a hospital that had insufficient staff because of cost-cutting concerns. So a physician in the emergency room had two responsibilities, one emergency room patients and the other was the intensive care unit if a cardiac arrest occurred, if a code blue occurred. Well, of course, it happened. Uh, he was the only physician responsible for both of those things. There was a code blue in the intensive care unit. At the same time, a patient came in with acute heart attack. Of course, there was a delay in managing the patient with acute heart attack. Of course, he had a, a large heart attack, of course, then he died. A couple of examples, or multiple examples throughout this book um, uh, of these types of issues called moral injury. In the corporate uh, healthcare world, physicians can be fired. Uh, stories of physicians being fired primarily for raising concerns about uh, quality of care or about uh, during the time of COVID, during the safety protocols. As many as 60, 65% of uh, emergency room physicians are at risk of being fired. Um, so, uh, again, it's all about the dollar and uh, productivity. So it's rather disturbing when a healthcare system relies more on MBAs in a private equity firm, insurance workers, administrators who have no medical experience to decide what tests and treatments are deemed acceptable. It's disturbing that the physician-patient relationship gets breached, gets altered, and patient care decisions can be influenced by outside factors, i.e. profit. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Risk of loss of accreditation by inadequate staff. It obviously hasn't happened so far. I mean, there's multiple, multiple examples. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 There you go. That's it. That's exactly right. That's, that's the issue physicians are facing. I don't have a, another answer, answer to that. But um, so, so what needs to occur, one, uh, and I'll move along now. We're obviously getting near the end. One, there needs to be a comprehensive corporate practice doctrine that prohibits medical management companies from exerting control over clinical judgment practice. Two, policies are needed to closely monitor billing practices and protect patient access to care. Three, greater transparency needs to be present in hospitals and, and uh, clinics, both in terms of, of their outcomes and their billing practices and so on. There needs to be legislation to uh, de-emphasize what is called superfluous documentation. And, and I can tell you examples of that on and on and on. 
An important thing is that health consumers need to be provided with the, um, better health information in terms of how to lower their risk of disease, and we're going to talk about that next week. If we can do that, then we can lower the demand for health care services and we can start positively affecting this uh, spiral of the cost of health care. Uh, we need to provide health care uh, consumers with better information so that they can establish better health habits, uh, better information and facts regarding choosing their physician, and make health care providers more accountable with data accessible. So, um, Advice to you all, to patients. One, the first step is to be aware of this phenomenon. So that's the reason for me giving this uh, uh, speech today. Ask questions. Well, very important, you know. You said to have a test. Well, what's the reason for this test? What do you expect this test to show? What will you do if it shows such and such? If it shows A, if it shows B, or if it shows C? What would you do? And then what's the risk? What's the benefits of, of what's being prescribed? What's, what's the risk of being prescribed? Evaluating risk, I think, is important. So, um, take, oh, well, uh, the, the, the slide you've all been waiting for. So, uh, find the right doctor. Uh, there is a site that's called MetaFind. It has uh, an analysis of over about 7,000 doctors in the United States of America. It also uh, has information keeping up to date with healthcare things. Um, it's, I think, somewhat helpful. It will tell a, a doctor's expertise in such and such an area so you can get a sense for well, what he's really uh, skilled at and what he's not really skilled at. So I'm going to summarize here by saying that uh, Health care in the United States of America is a profit-generating machine. It's been taken over by corporate investors, uh, hospitals, pharmacies, real estate investment trusts, as I mentioned. The more is better philosophy has clearly taken firm root in our system. More service utilization, more technology, more growth, more layers of management, more layers for profit. It's been accompanied by more admissions, more unnecessary surgery, more inappropriate prescribing, more diagnostic testing, more fraud and abuse, more days in the hospital, more readmissions, more of whatever made more money. So the, the, what should occur also is the medical profession and patients, I think, should be uh, banding together. And I have just now received the signal that it's time to stop. And so I will stop. <laughs> you,